All right, let's get started. So um, I'm going to briefly go over uh, solutions to the breakout section uh, that we started on uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and in case you don't know, um, I'm Eric Pettigura. I'm one of the counselors here. All right, so um, we're going to be working in IPython. Uh, so from my terminal, this is the directory where my notebooks are stored. Uh, you see them here, trapezoid rule and uh, homework one solutions. We'll be going over that later. Um, so I'm going to fire up the IPython notebook with this incantation here. Um, and then notice this dash dash pylab inline. Um, and inline basically lets you uh, display plots right in the notebook. Eric, can you get some of the lights? Sure. Uh, in the middle of the chalkboard. Uh, Below the middle of the chalkboard. Uh, just to your right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That good? All right, so we're going to fire up uh, the IPython notebook. It's going to open up a, um, a web browser. And uh, let's take a look at the solutions. So um, the trapezoid rule is um, sort of the next level of uh, sophistication uh, to computing the area under a curve um, beyond just the strict uh, Riemann sum. So you're basically, with the trapezoid rule, you're just computing the average value uh, at a bunch of different step sizes and then summing those up times the, uh, the width of the step. So coding this up is fairly simple. Um, we, it's a one line, uh, it's essentially a one line call. Um, and the only thing that you need to be sure that you understand about uh, this a uh, piece of code over here is the way that the slicing uh, syntax works. So is everyone clear on what this one colon and colon minus one do? All right, would somebody care to explain what that, what that does? Sure. So the one colon takes everything starting with element number one, and the colon minus one takes everything up to the last element. Yeah, exactly. So you're effectively uh, computing the step size. So this, this would be the dx um, in the integral. OK? Um, so this function will compute the, inter the integral given uh, the, the points uh, along the independent variable, so the x, and then also pre-computed uh, points uh, of the function, uh, values of the function, which is uh, in this y array. But if we actually need to, on the fly, compute what the values of the function are, we can just uh, extend this um, integrator a little farther and basically just uh, evaluate it inside. And the one thing that uh, this function buys you is that you, you can now specify the number of uh, samples you're going to take uh, and the range that you're going to take them over. So uh, this NP lin space is a function we touched on briefly yesterday. And it basically creates an evenly spaced, evenly sampled array from value A to value B with n points inside it. So this is basically going to create an evenly spaced grid uh, along your independent variable. And then f is um, actually a function. So in Python, it's perfectly all right to pass a function to another function as an argument. And in this case, um, you know, our function could be something as simple as this. OK, so we can define that and then pass that to the trap ZF function. Um, and then the next exercise um, was just to evaluate both of these. Um, and in the IPython notebook, um, when you first open it, nothing is evaluated to start off with. So you need to actually um, evaluate each one of the cells before you 
um, get access to the code that's written within it. Yes? Why did you have to import the to do all this? Could you speak up a bit? Why did you have to import NumPy? Um, okay, because we're using NumPy func oh, why didn't, why didn't I have to? Yeah. Ah, exactly. Okay, so um, that was this command uh, down here, this dash dash pylab. We'll get into what this does in a little bit, um, but you can imagine that sort of in your day-to-day -day workflow, you're gonna be importing a lot of the same modules over and over again. So for example, NumPy, and then also your, um, you know, maybe your plotting function. So basically, PyLab is just um, you know, a short piece of code that loads in commonly used modules for scientific computing. Um, so that's just a shortcut. But you can see that um, it loaded NumPy as .np, or um, np, right? So that's how I'm calling the functions in NumPy, np.linspace. OK, so um, I'm going to evaluate uh, this cell. Um, so you can see that number went up by 1. Okay, so what this cell did is just uh, compared uh, the result from uh, both of those integration functions. So uh, this one over here and this one over here, just verifying that they have the same, they got the same result. Um, and there is a one-line definition of a function f of x. Okay, um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to investigate how the error. Um, using the trapezoid rule decreases with respect to uh, the exact value computed, you know, computed using uh, just calculus. Um, and you know, you can, I think it's fairly easy to see that as you decrease the size of the, um, uh, of the trapezoids that the error uh, compared to the exact answer will go down. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just um, instantiating a list with a variety of um, values for endpoints and just iterating over that. Okay, So what I did was I created a, an empty list and for each value in endpoints what I did was I just added uh, the error essentially, the value computed using the trapezoid rule minus the exact value and then just added that. So now I have a list called error which is the same length as endpoints. And so now um, I can plot one against the other. Right? So I evaluated that cell. Um, it's a very simple plot. Um, it's basically a plot that has a linear scale in the x-axis and a log scale in the y-axis. And thankfully, all our errors were positive um, because you know this doesn't go negative. Um, and that's about it. We put some fancy text up on the title, um, and that's perfectly okay using uh, Matplotlib's uh, LaTeX environment. Where did you define exact? Uh, exact up here is just up here. So that's just you know. Uh, so the integral that we're trying to compute is the following integral, right? So that's just yeah. which is nine. Okay, uh, so uh, we're gonna do this again, um, but we're going to uh, use a little more interesting function. Um, so here it is. Um, and basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the area under this curve. Um, so we're defining what our limits of integration are uh, using these variables. Um, and basically what we're doing here, you can think of it as something more akin to this. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, it, uh, we're setting two variables uh, at the same line. And that saves a little space, but it's personal preference. And then let me speak a little bit about um, what we're doing over here. Um, so what we're doing 
is we're taking all of the values of x and all of the values of y that are between a and b. Okay, so let's say this is um, so if this is our function, right? We want to just only work with the values that are inside the range that we want to integrate over. Right? And um, the way that we do that is by using uh, a Boolean mask. So um, let's break this apart um, a little bit. OK, so um, the notebook's good for a lot of things, but it's not a terminal. So when I want to actually uh, you know, take a look and uh, you know, maybe do uh, you know, function question mark or try to understand uh, what, you know, what a certain variable is. Um, I, I like to work in something that looks more like a terminal. And IPython provides that to you. Um, all you have to do is basically just start up this thing called the Qt console. How did you insert that one above? Um, I just did, um, you know, you can go up to insert, insert cell above, and there's also a keyboard shortcut. Um, and all the keyboard shortcuts you can get by doing help keyboard shortcuts. Okay, so um, let me evaluate this and then go over what all those things mean. So I'll just copy this line over here because there's a couple things happening on this line at the same time. Okay, all right, so x int is, uh, you know, it's all of the values of the function defined from, you know, one to eight, eight and a half. Um, it's not a very finely sampled grid. We're trying to integrate from, uh, from one to nine. So this is a fairly coarse integration, right? So x greater than or equal to a. So remember, a is just one. A is the lower uh, the lower limit of integration. Uh, so x greater than or equal to a. Basically, for every value in x, it asks, is this value greater than or equal to a? And uh, you can see for the lower values, it's false, and then it becomes true, and it's true for the rest of the array, right? And then likewise, uh, x less than or equal to b is uh, basically saying where the array is uh, less than the, uh, the, upper, the upper bound. So then what we want to do is we want to combine these uh, just using um, Boolean operators. And the way that... Um, that I showed you first uses this function, logical and, um, and it does exactly what you think it would do, just basically goes element by element and returns true if the first argument and the second argument are true, and false if any of them are false. It's just a, a normal Boolean and. And it does that element by element. So now we have another Boolean array. Um, just to mention, uh, this isn't the only way of performing that operation. You can also do something that's a little more compact. And that gives the same value, right? Um, OK. So now that we have this Boolean uh, array, and I'll just give it a new name. So B, oh crap, I overloaded B. All right. Okay, so here's my Boolean array. Um, then what I can do is basically just uh, use that to return uh, a subset of another array. So I've got x, right? So this basically returns all of the values of x where uh, the Boolean, where BL is true. Okay, so that's basically just taking a subset of x, right? Let's uh, page up till we, got, till we get to the original line. All right, so this is the original line. And then the last thing that's going on on this line is that we're slicing it, okay? Um, and are people clear what this uh, colon colon 30 means? What is that doing? Yeah, so this um, colon colon 30 is basically starting at the element, the zeroth element, and then skipping by 30s, all right? 
So we have a, a 200, a length 200 array, but we're only uh, returning every 30th uh, element. So our array is very coarsely sampled. So x int, if we look at the size of that um, and look at the size of x, uh, we're going from 200 down to 6. All right, uh, let's look back at the, uh, the notebook, okay? Um, and basically, uh, we're just plotting, uh, making a plot of the function and showing the, uh, where we're, our, our integration. Um, and finally, the sort of the last, the last thing is uh, basically to say like, you know, it was very, it was fairly easy to, um, you know, to write our own integrator using the trapezoid rule. But in sort of general, uh, you know, in your general coding life, you don't want to do that. You just want to use something that's been uh, written already because there are much more sophisticated uh, and numerically accurate ways and numerically fast ways to compute the area under a curve. And one of these ends, um, they're contained in this scipy.integrate uh, module. So if we take a look at that, scipy.integrate, remember that if you're curious about what a module does, you can just query up the um, doc string. <coughs> And this gives you sort of a high-level list of um, the integration tools um, that it gives you. And uh, you know, without going into detail, these are a lot more sophisticated and will give you a much more accurate result than the trapezoid rule. Um, so you know, here is the, integrate, uh, the, uh, the integral computing using this quad routine. You can see that it's very close um, to the exact value. This is the error on that, and, uh, and then using the trapezoid rule with six points gives you something that you know, looks like it has about 10% fractional error. So, uh, you know, this, and this, the quad routine actually works faster than your own trapezoid routine. All right, so um, let's move over to the, um, the homework solutions. So the first thing that we want to do is um, load up the data that's in this uh, CSV file. Um, and there's a, a convenient function called CSV to rec that will basically read in a CSV file and put, in, uh, put it into a record array. And I'll sort of go into briefly what uh, each of those functions um, are and what a record array is. So if I fire up the Qt console again, and then take a look at CSV to rec, just query it, you get a, um, a nice little description of what it does. But if you look in the, um, in sort of one of the first lines, you can see where that module came from. And this module came from the matplotlib package um, and then the, uh, the MLAB submodule. And this is one of these things that was imported when we did dash dash pylab. So what dash dash pylab effectively did was to said from matplotlib uh, dot mlab import star, right? And it loaded all of the functions in the matplotlib dot mlab submodule into uh, the namespace. Now, um, okay, so that's what CSV to rec does. Now let's talk about what a record array is. So if I just uh, hit enter in my, QT, in my, um, my notebook, I get sort of a view of what this data is. So you see that there's, um, there's dates in here, there's integers, um, and then at the end, there's a sort of description of what each one of those data elements are. Um, so you probably um, you know, worked with data like this before, but just to make sure that you understand what it is, um, is, is this data one-dimensional or two-dimensional? What's the dimensionality of this data set? Okay, one. Anybody want to disagree? 
Okay, so I heard one and, uh, and two dimensional. Um, and the correct answer is it's one, it's one dimensional. Um, but the reason why it's easy to make that mistake is that you're accustomed to seeing this data um, you know, in a table, like an Excel table. Um, so basically there's rows of data, so like you know, row one, row two, and then you have your columns or your keys. So this would be you know, your different values, and then each one of these has some sort of value in here, right? This could be like a name and a time, right? But the data structure itself is in fact one dimensional. And each one of these different columns are just um, related one dimensional quantities. Um, so if we ask this record array, um, if we run the ndim function, which just returns the dimensionality, uh, you get one. OK. So um, we have all this data in a nice uh, record array. Um, now we want to plot it. Um, so like I said before, um, the matplotlib, uh, uh, the dash dash pylab um, option, when we fired up the IPython notebook, loaded a bunch of things into the top level namespace. Uh, one of these functions is called plot. Um, just give you a simple example of what plot does. You know, as always, um, you can, you know, do the question mark and uh, and give yourself, um, you know, a high level uh, introduction to what the function does. But um, you know, we can just give it a simple example. Um, and you know, there's x. Uh, x squared. Okay. Okay. So um, we want to plot this uh, this data up, and uh, basically to do that, I just called the plot command several times. Um, Matplotlib knows how to interpret the date time uh, type, um, and then here are uh, are all the different time series colored in, in different colors. Um, and essentially, what this does, uh, when you call plot several times, um, it assumes that you don't actually want a new window unless you specify it. It just assumes that you want to plot over what you've already plotted. So, um, you know, if you're used to using IDL, this would be like O plot. Um, and then the nice thing about uh, this plot function is that uh, there's a keyword argument called label, and you just pass it a string. And it's basically, you can label any so called artist in matplotlib. So I've just uh, given these, you know, all of these a label, and then at the end, I just uh, ran this legend command with no arguments, and it gave me sort of a you know, fairly ordinary looking legend. Um, and if I wanted to make this thing look nicer, um, you can imagine that there are tons of options that you could do to make it look as pretty as you want. Um, and one of the nice things about record arrays is um, you can query, you can iterate over the values. So in many ways, they're like a dictionary. They have a key, um, which is the, you know, uh, the column name, K1, K2. Um, and uh, they have a value, which is you know, all the values in the row. Um, so one way to, to make this plot um, a little more economically in terms of lines of code is to just iterate over the values. Um, So that's what I did over here. I just defined all the names that I wanted to plot as a list, um, and then I iterated over them for name in names, and then basically plotted week start against all the different values, uh, set the label, and ran the legend command. If you don't want to overplot, how do you do it? So um, if you want to create a new plot, um, so since I'm, not, since I'm not working interactively, um, this isn't going to be particularly obvious, um, but I can just start a new version. OK, so this is what you get when you just um, type this into your IPython shell. Um, or your IPython interpreter. If I want to clear this plot, um, I just 
run this command, and that clears it, and now I'm ready to plot again. And you can see that every time I plot um, you know, a new function, uh, it's just changing the color, so it's over plotting. Um, but if you, want, if you want two windows, then you have to uh, open up a new figure like that. And then you actually need to refer to these figures um, sort of individually. So there's a concept in matplotlib called the current figure, and the current figure is basically the last one you used. And for you know, most of your work, you, you basically want to be referring to the current figure. Uh, there's a command called get current figure, um, and that's that's the object. Um, Matplotlib is is very rich, very complex. Um, this is only a quick introduction. If you'd like to know more, you can talk to one of the counselors. Um, we might be getting into more of that later. Anyway. Okay. So then um, the next problem asked uh, to, turn, uh, to return the minimum and the maximum value for one of the columns. Um, I think it was spring, spring, oh, it was all of the columns. Um, so we want to figure out at what week did the peak interest in this topic um, happen and you know, at what week you know, did hardly anybody care about it at all. Um, so you know, the function that we use to figure out this is called argmax, right? But if you didn't know it, um, let me sort of uh, walk you through how you might find it, OK? So again, um, I'm going to go to the Qt console, right? And what I'm interested in is the maximum value. So um, you know, since I'm working with an array, I might uh, you know, put in a NumPy, and then max, and then question mark, right? Um, and basically, OK, so I can read this. It says, return the maximum of an array. Okay, so that's close to what I want, right? I, I want the max. I want the week at which the value was the maximum, but I don't want the maximum value itself, right? Or I want both quantities. Um, so I can read this doc uh, this doc string a little more, and um, what it has is this sort of C also these functions that are sort of related. Um, and so I can read that and I go, oh, argmax. That's the indices of the maximum values. Okay, so that's actually what I want. Okay, so if I run this, um, you know, I'm basically <clears throat> finding the maximum value, um, and then you know, this is the uh, uh, the index of the um, the the array where the maximum value, uh, maximum interest in spring break occurred, um, and this is just a string telling you that. Um, so again, I can loop over the keys in an array. Um, just by referring to them by their string name. Um, and I've done that here. So I'm basically uh, getting the maximum value using this argmax function, minimum value using the argmin function, um, and then just printing them out like this. And this l just just means um, you know tack on white spaces to the right side of a word up to a certain length. Um, and that just makes the table a little prettier. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I'm I'm attaching the characters to the to the right side of the word. So yeah, left justification. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to do some basic um, statistics. Basically, the problem was um, to answer what term has the largest scatter about the median value. Um, so scatter about the median value could mean a few different things. Um, it could be standard deviation. It could be um, you know, median, uh, median absolute deviation, um, and I did the latter. Um, and so again, I'm just iterating over names, all right? I'm pulling out the specific uh, column with that name. I'm computing the median. Um, then I'm subtracting the median off of that um, value, off of that array, computing the absolute value, and then computing the median value of all of that. Right? And then for each one of them, I just print it out. And you can see that uh, textbooks had the minimum scatter, and Kayak had the most scatter. Um, sorry. Sure. Yeah, this is for the previous row. Uh, I thought that the homework said to find the maximum for every year. Okay. The way I was done was like a maximum for the whole data 
Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I misread that. Um, so in order to do max and min for a given year, you need to select uh, subregions of that particular array. So you could say you you could basically do what we were doing before in the integrate example, and basically query all of the indices for a particular year, uh, and then basically do that again. So I actually just misread the problem. So I'm, I'm running a little short on time, and I want to stay on time, so um, let's uh, hold those until the end. Um, and then the, the last problem was basically uh, to evaluate what the correlation was between these two trends. Um, and if you're not familiar what, with what a correlation is, um, you know, essentially you've got a function that's you know, peaks. Um, and you want to correlate that with another function. Basically, what a correlation is is it um, you know it slides one of these arrays um, past the other, and then computes the product element-wise, and then sums that. All right, so it's a measure of a. It's a basically gives you a degree of how well um, each one of the arrays line up. Um, it's peaked um, sort of in the middle because uh, since this function is everywhere positive, um, you know, you're going to get the, maximums, uh, the maximum sum when they're sort of right on top of each other. But you see all of these, um, these sub-peaks, and that happens because one of the functions, um, because the functions have a very similar peak structure, there's one peak per year, and uh, when you slide them uh, past each other, when you slide by the correct delay, you get a maximum. Um, and so basically, I did the same um, uh, argmax function on uh, the result of the correlation for just one year, located that peak, and basically determined that uh, the peak occurs when you've displaced uh, the two arrays by 33 elements, or 33 meters. Um, okay, all right, so um, now we'll take a few questions. All right, that uh, will. Okay. Um, so about argmax, yeah. so the way that you called it, you were basically saying empty.argmax um, for whatever, trans name, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so basically, you're saying that that's the same thing as property Yeah, it's exactly the same. Um, so, yeah, there's sort of a couple ways um, to call a few functions in. Um, Using uh, using ND arrays, so uh, we can take a look at this in the QT console. Let's so let's just um, let's just look at the result array. Um, that was the last the last array that we worked with. Um, so so argmax works in this way, which is how I was doing it. All right, but if you uh, if you type the array in IPython and then you hit tab, what it gives you is a list of all of the methods and attributes that are attached to an ND array, right? So, uh, so attributes, um, basically, um, we'll get into this later today, uh, tell you something about the object, okay? So I think there's an attribute called NDIM, right? So that gives you the dimensionality. But there are other... Um, you know, things like attributes uh, called methods, which are basically things that that object can do. And one of the things that this object can do is tell you the index of the maximum value, okay? So that basically calls the same code, but one of them is more object-oriented and one is sort of more procedural-oriented. Um, who's giving the next talk? Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, all right, up there. So when you do correlation, it seems a bit strange to me. So it, it looks like you correlate spring break and spring break. And it's strange that the correlation is not maximum with zero. Because if you correlate two things and the, you don't have this correlation, the correlation is maximum. Oh, whoops. I did correlate spring break and spring yeah, break. Exactly. That's, that's the thing. There's, then the maximum should be at zero. So the maximum is at zero displacement, um, but the way that uh, 
So the way that correlate the that the result works, and this is sort of just a convention, um, is uh, let's see. So let me space this out a little better. All right. So the result. So this first correlation result, the first correlation you can do is when there's just one overlap, okay? Um, there's one overlapping element. So it's displaced by the length of the array minus one, right? And this value goes into result zero, all right? Then this one gets shifted over by one element. You compute the correlation again. Um, and that one goes into result uh, one, okay? So the maximum should occur when it's shifted by, uh, you know, the length, right? So, this is just a convention with um, how this particular implementation of the correlation is defined. Right, so that's what I mean. The, so the maximum on your graph is where they both are exactly the same. So that means that the maximum correlation, so the lag you need to plot is, is not is not very plotted, but it's, it's somewhere near the middle, the next peak of the middle. Yeah. So if you were interested in plotting uh, something like a lag, um, let's see. So let's take a look at. All right. So we can take a look at the length of result. All right. So result dot size. So that's another attribute of an array. Um, and then we can do, um, if you're interested in doing like a lag, we can do result size. Um, let's see. Okay, so now you so now it's you know going from uh, negative value to a positive value. So we've just shifted it. It's just our it's just in our definition of um, you know what our independent variable is. Okay, and um, you know don't pay attention to the vertical line anymore. But um, I've just shifted everything in the plots so that the uh, the peak is at zero. Yeah, no, it's more meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> just, just listen so, um, all right, so I think I see um, why this was confusing. Um, first, so what I did was I, I just plotted result, and when you plot something with only one iterable, right, or only one array, um, it assumes that the array that you want to plot is the independent variable, the y variable. And as an x variable, it just basically uh, goes you know, from 0 up to the length. So it basically is, it plots the same thing as a range result dot size. Right? So that's just what plot is assuming you meant. So it's basically plotting value versus index. Okay? Um, but I agree that plotting against something like a lag makes more sense. If you're doing a lot of analysis all using uh, some of the packages, what's a typical way of um, shortening down to those? So the question was, um, so we're, you know, with Python is, is very modular, and you know, if you have a complex module, you might have sub-modules of sub-modules of modules, right? Um, so the question was, um, how can we shorten the name or make it easier, um, you know, to, to use? Um, and we've actually already been um, doing some of those tricks, but they might have been sort of behind the scenes. Um, so one of the functions that we used today was called CSV to rec. Right? Um, and basically, the way to get at this function, um, if you were to just sort of do it, uh, doing it, you know, using the, um, the sort of standard way, would be you would import matplotlib.mlab. Okay, so that I've imported that. And then now to call this function, uh, 
I would do this. Okay, so that's pretty long. And um, you, know, you don't want to be typing like you know, those 20 characters all the time. Um, so it's perfectly all right to do from matplotlib import csv to rec. Okay, so that's imported this function, and now to call it, you can only um, you know type csv to rec. Or if you want to be even more slick, you can basically on the fly rename what this function is. All right, so csv to rec is f. All right, so now that entire line is collapsed to one character, and then I can basically do the same thing with just that function. All right. Great.